Good evening, folks. Belfast Boxing and Blues. Welcome, welcome. You know, you want to hit subscribe, you want to hit like, you want to do all that good stuff, guys, you know, because it uh, helps grow this tiny, tiny, tiny little channel. It's something magnificent that we can all be proud of and that uh, can be of use, hopefully, you know, be of use with some good. Uh, some good advice <laughs> to the scoundrels of this world, you know, the downtrodden. Yeah, we have to reach out the helping hand, you know, because somebody reached out for us. So it's time to pay it forward. That's what it's all about, isn't it? Um, guys, this is going to be a music music video. For the most part today, it's gonna, I have two songs. We're going to do two songs and we're going to... Have a quick skim through them. Look at what way they're put together. Look at the history of how they were written. And we'll see if we can get any little tidbits off uh, Wikipedia. Um, we'll talk about them in a wee minute. Uh, <clears throat> before we get to that, I've been, as usual, just enjoying the content. Just just enjoying what YouTube has to offer. Um, back on the MMAR there. And... Uh, yeah, it was quite good. They they had a nice selection of people on. They had Clarissa Shields on, who was quite good actually. I really enjoyed Clarissa Shields, man. She was good crack. You know, she comes in for a bit of stick sometimes. Um, some some people don't like her attitude. They think that she's a bit too a bit too confident. Um, she yeah, that can rub people up the wrong way. But you know, she's a boxer. <laughs> Boxers are supposed to be like that, man. You're supposed to back yourself, but um. Yeah, uh, I've heard some say that it's because she's a woman. That when men do it, it's not such a big thing. You're McGregor's and you're Mayweather's. And pretty much, you know, I watched a few guys come on that show. That Masvidal guy, he's a scary, <laughs> scary dude. But uh, he come on and, you know what I mean? He, he's 100% backing himself. All of these guys do. That That's part of the game. And now we have a woman doing it, you know. She's not going to come in and play humble and stuff. She's going to back herself all the way. And I think that's all right. And do you know what? Even when she is doing that, she seems like a nice person, especially when she's on a little Zoom interview type of thing, and not not so much of a you know a big high media type thing, you know. So that was quite nice to see her in that in that setting. And like I say, Maz Vidal was on. He's <laughs> he's scary. <laughs> he's 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 legitimately scary. You know, it starts to make me feel a little bit worried for what I say about some of these athletes you know um because you, you never know what might happen and who you might run into in the future and, and you know speaking of mma and mixed martial arts uh, I, I was i was speaking to a pal who's 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 going to be doing some classes sort of incognito sort of underground you know but um yeah there's going to be all sorts of stuff you know there'll be striking and there'll be boxing and there'll be grappling there'll be holes and throws and even meditation breathing all sorts you know but like i say very much incognito um flying beneath the radar you know <laughs> i'm sure there are reasons it's a bit like fight club really <laughs> yeah um which is interesting you know i, I met a guy out uh, one night in uh, a voodoo voodoo bar in belfast just yeah, shout out yet another bar in belfast it's a great bar why not and um there was a guy, I met this fella, um, and he's like an entrepreneurial type guy, you know, he has, uh, I got him on, on Instagram and stuff, he, I think he's doing a documentary at, at, at the minute where he's trying to like coalesce, I know that's, that's my word of the week, I'm going to use it yet again, that's a good word man, you can get a few rinses out of that one, can't you, coalesce um, the identity of sort of both sides of the religious and the cultural divide in Northern Ireland to more of a let's all be one and let's be proud of being northern irish rather than saying oh well we're british we're part of this or we're irish we're part of this that was the angle i think he was a little bit drunk when he was <laughs> when he was explaining to me what it was why well, as far as this guy was a picture of ed norton and he was really 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 looked like him so i was i was a buzz you know talking to that guy um so yeah uh, the last person they had on then before i tuned out was uh Oh, what's his name? Riddle, is it? Somebody Riddle or something like that. And so he's like a wrestler. He had been in the UFC and then he went in the WWE and stuff. And 
I think he's fighting on all sorts of platforms, you know. Um, <laughs> I think his, his, his nickname is the King of All Bros, which was, I thought was quite cool, you know, man. This guy is the King of All Bros. And he's just a typical, you know, surfer dude with the long hair, muscled out to the D-I-C-K. And um, it was great, man. And, you know, he talked about a lot of different things. He had been through rehab and bits and pieces. And, you know, he, uh, but he come back. He come back, you know. Uh, it's interesting, these, it happens quite a lot, you know, in all walks of life, people, they run into some kind of trouble or some kind of hardship or something like this, you know, and it's the comeback, man, when they make the comeback and when they find redemption, you know, it's the Rocky story, isn't it? And we like to see that. Um, we like to see people making a comeback. So, uh, we'll get down to these two songs in just a minute. I have maybe one other thing to say, yes. So um, I was speaking to, to a lovely guy earlier and I did mention it that he'd give me a few tips on how to move this thing forward, you know, in, in terms of like better sound quality for one thing, <laughs> because I've realised you have to turn, you have to put it on a speaker or headphones in order to hear it at all and you've got to turn it right up, you know, so it's not, the sound quality isn't great and, and the volume is an issue, so eventually i'm i am like i say i have a friend who he has a pretty good camera and stuff and he's going to help me out with stuff but i'm also going to need my own camera i'm getting a new phone i'm getting the very latest iphone as well so that will hopefully help matters in itself like i say my friend will be on call and we'll do some stuff and it'll be a bit more professional we might even be able to do you know different angles and things like that and we can whack it onto some computer program and cut bits out maybe get a little intro jingle and stuff like that um, yeah, I mean, we could do all sorts then, you know what I mean, you could bring up clips and pictures and, you know, really uh, go to town on it, you know, and um, and I try and be a bit more uh, specific in terms of, alright, well, this is what this video is going to be about and we're going to stick to that, you know, <laughs> and not, not just press the red button, talk for 40 minutes about God knows what and then, you know, stick a random title on it and hope for the best, you know, so, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I think what's going on here is, is a pretty good thing and it has potential. So obviously we want to uh, boost it as best as possible and try and accommodate uh, the p potential sort of followers and listeners and subscribers to the channel uh, by making sure that the content is as high a quality and as accessible as possible. And um, like I say, we're talking a bit about MMA now, you know, and... Um, I'll be doing a bit of kickboxing, I'll be I'll, I'll be doing some straight up boxing and I'll, I'll be doing some martial arts stuff as well, you know, um, and uh, so we'll, we'll be able to talk about all that, we can talk about wrestling, we can talk about football, we got Man United right on here, so yeah, lots of things to talk about and like I say, it makes it more open to everybody, you know, because not everybody's a straight up boxing fan. And not everybody's a hardcore musician that wants to come in and, you know, get into the real nitty gritty, you know. So if we can uh, make it generalize it a little bit more, you know, and like I say, we, we, we can get more people involved. And then the more people that are involved and the stronger it gets and the better it is for everybody, no matter what department or in what ways these people are involved. Who knows how that'll work, you know. Try not to question it too much. But, um, yeah. So the two songs that I was looking up, first up was Red Red Barchetta or Red Barchetta by Rush, <clears throat> which I love. I really love that song. And um, the other was Dreadlock Holiday by 10CC. And that was inspired by, I tried to get the article again, I couldn't find it, but that was inspired by, I haven't seen an article earlier where the guy was uh, having to answer to claims of cultural cultural misappropriation is, is that the word uh, whatever it is yeah so um he basically came out and he told the whole story of the song which had something to do with he had visited jamaica and he had seen this white guy hanging out and he was <laughs> this this white guy was trying to hang with 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 these uh jamaican dudes and apparently and it was sort of like pretty fly for a white guy you know in his own mind he was top dog but <laughs> maybe to the to the outsider it was a different story altogether but here you know it's all good man it's all good uh, let's uh 
I think that's an unfair stereotype as well. I think those, those type of guys exist. What were the, the, the island guys, those two island guys and stuff like that. You guys that take it to the limit, but... Like, I know a few white guys with, like, dreadlocks and stuff like that, and they don't try to act, you know, like they're Jamaican or something like that. But I do think that, you know, it's okay to lean into other cultures and pull a little bit of this and a little bit of that. As long as you know who you are and where you come from, and that's still your main bit, you know what I mean? It's, you know, the, the human psyche is a strange thing, you know? We all like different around different people, different groups of friends. You talk to one friend one way, you talk to the other this group the other way. Yeah, but that's all cool, you know. <laughs> it's all good, man. So Red Barquetta, let's read a, a little bit about it while I finish this cigarette and then we'll get down to breaking it down a little bit. And you know what? Bear in mind this is Rush. <laughs> this is Alex Le Alex Lifeson, uh Neil Pert and Getty Lee. So you know, we're, we're talking top, top, top level musicians here. I've had a quick look at it. I have a fair idea of what the chords and the different parts are, but I will not be able to replicate it fully. I will do my best. And you know what? The rest of it's there for you to go and work out for yourself. So, but it'll be cool just to investigate it and have a wee look and see what's going on, you know? So, um, Red Barquetta is a song by the Canadian rock band Rush from their 1981 studio album, Moving Pictures. Classic album. The song was inspired by the futuristic short story, A Nice Morning Drive, written by Richard Foster and published in the November 1973 issue of Road and Track magazine. You know what I mean? Ne Neil Peart, like, where's he pulling this stuff from? So, like, Neil Peart obviously was the drummer in Rush, but he wrote the lyrics. So, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I think Getty Lee was writing all the lyrics, and then they had a different drummer, and they brought Pert in, and after a while, we're like, this guy's weird. <laughs> this guy's really strange. He's using all these big words and stuff. It's like, why don't we see if he can write lyrics for a couple of songs? And it worked. I think he did a concept album. I, don't, I can't remember the name of it, but um, <laughs> it was some crazy comic book style stuff. You know, it was like... It was like the Scientology uh, myth, you know, something close to that. It was really quite bizarre, but um, yeah, I think he was into motorbikes as well. He liked to get on his motorbike and go on long drives, which might be why he was reading Road and Track magazine. So, the story describes a similar future in which, um, in which increasingly stringent safety regulations have forced cars to evolve into massive modern safety vehicles, MSVs. Capable of withstanding a 50 mile per hour. 80 kilometer per hour impact without injury to the driver. Consequently, drivers with MSVs have become less safe, less safety conscious and more aggressive. And bouncing, intentionally ramming the older, smaller cars is a common sport among some. Rush drummer and, lyri and Rush drummer and lyricist Neil Pert, 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 Neil Pert made several attempts to contact Foster during the recording of Moving Pictures, but Road and Track did not have an up to date address. And Rush were. We say address here, address in America, you say address, address, yeah, that's all right. And Rush were forced to settle for a brief inspired by note in the lyric sheet mentioning the story. So that was back in the 70s, right? In July 2007, Foster and Peart finally made contact with each other. Foster later posted on his website an account of their journey by motorcycle through the backwoods of West Virginia between stops on Rush's 2007 Snakes and Arrows tour. It's a funny thing with Rush being like a quite a progressive band, pro progressive rock band. You know, they had that like they were often compared to Zeppelin. I think in their early years, and of course the influences there and stuff. I think a lot there were a lot of bands that you know took from Zeppelin and that they had the you know blonde. Uh, permed you know uh strapping lead vocalist and, and all of that and it was all about the high notes and stuff and 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 you know the, the the guitar player with mystique and all of that but um maybe the more progressive elements of zeppelin's music was overlooked by by some of those copyists you know um, no no harm there because we all copy zeppelin like let's you know let's uh let's be honest with ourselves here so barchetta, literally small boat in Italian, is the diminutive form of barca, boat or craft. 
In the automotive industry, the term is used for a two-seat car without any kind of roof. The proper Italian pronunciation is barchetta, with a K rather than the whatever that is, some baguette Lee. Che, 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 that sound. Neil Peart's favourite car was a 1948 Ferrari 166mm Barchetta. Okay, right, so there's lots going on there. That's a nice that's a nice bit of background. We'll read one more bit here because it's it's quite a lengthy article and you know we don't wanna uh, spend all day reading do we? So uh, lyrics the song's lyrics tell a story set in a future in which many classes of vehicles have been banned by a motor law. I always thought that lyric was motor lodge. Oh, I got that wrong. The narrator's uncle has kept one of these now legal vehicles, the titular red Barquetta sports car, in pristine condition for roughly 50 years and is hiding it at his secret country home, which had been a farm before the motor law was enacted. Every Sunday, the narrator commits a weekly crime of sneaking out to this location and going for a drive in the countryside. So, yeah, I mean, it, there is that lyric that one will get to it soon where, where he speaks about going out to commit this weekly crime, you know, to get into this racy red high speed vehicle. And, um, yeah, I, I guess it is a crime in that time when, when, when uh, that law was in place, you know, but he managed to get away with it once a week anyway. Uh, for some reason, his, his uncle was involved. Well, his uncle was the one who had the car, who hid the car basically for him, but, um, Look, regardless of all that, let's see what's going to happen here. So, look, going out for a drive in the countryside. During one such drive, he encounters the equivalent of the police in the form of a gleaming aloe air car, followed soon by a second, which culminates into a fantastic car chase until the narrator drives across a one-lane bridge that is too narrow for the air cars. The song ends with the narrator returning safely to his uncle's farm. So yeah, I mean, he's, I think the last line is, you know, he sits by the fire to dream with his uncle. And um, I think we all, we all have an uncle, you know, but we all have many uncles, you know. Our uncle, uncles are funny things, aren't they, you know, because it's like, it's your dad, but it's not, you know. <laughs> you know, uncles are like role models, but they're sort of dodgy as well, you know what I mean? Because you, you get to see the size of, of, of your uncle that you wouldn't see of your dad, you know what I mean? Um, because the father, of course, must try and project some image of uh, legality and, uh, you know, he, he's the main role model, so he's, he's, he's got to try and <laughs> be as upstanding as possible. The uncle, no, nah, the uncle can be swigging whiskey and having a wee smoke and he'll be telling you all the stories of the day, you know? So it's nice to dream with your uncle by the fireside. So um, to me, the lyric in this and more so the vocal melody and the style in which Getty Lee sings it is very reminiscent of their compatriot, their Canadian compatriot, Joni Mitchell. And I think at some point down the line, he had spoke with that of Joni Mitchell being an influence on their music and stuff. Um, of course, Joni Mitchell is up in the pantheon, you know, of singer songwriters. She's, she's really probably the best. You know, you've got her and, and you've got Dylan, you know, in, in that class, you've got Van Morrison. He's got to be up there. Come on. And, you know, Paul Simon, uh, guys like that. Uh, the added thing probably that would maybe even lift Joni Mitchell out of that category again is, is the work that she'd done uh, with Charles Mingus. And then, you know, obviously she had like guys like, uh, oh, who was it that played with her? Uh, you know the names. You know them before I say them. But come on, who's got it? Who's got it? So Yako, she had Yako Pastorius, yeah, or Jacko, or whatever they call that guy, with the fretless bass. So he was playing in her current band, uh, Pat Metheny. Yeah, you know what I mean? The top, top, best of the best guys, like she had them. What was the guy that played in Weather Report as well, the saxophonist? Wayne Shorter, did he play with Johnny Mitchell as well? Yeah, so... Joni's Joni's something else. She's she's still alive. She's such an artist, you know, and she's also a painter. And you know, she there are so many uh, so many elements to 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 what she does. She really is a fine, fine, fine artist. <laughs> a fine looking lady in her day. Yeah, this say, come on, come on, man. It's Joni Mitchell. So um, I always wondered about her and, and Van Morrison. You know, was there a mutual respect there? Because you never hear one mention the other. Never. Um, 
But then again, you never hear Van Morrison mention, say, uh, you know, uh, there are other guys in those categories that never mention each other's names. But the guys a little lower down will mention their names because they're still heroes to them to some to some degree. Um, but those top guys sort of keep stum. I'm sure they see each other at some charity event every once and again and have a little joke and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, so there's Johnny. And uh, I'm going to play the, the worst version of this ever, right? And, and try and demonstrate it. You know when you see like Rick Beato or the guy out of the darkness doing the video and they're like, they're trying, <laughs> they're really in a, such an awkward position. They're listening to the record and then they're going, oh yeah, that's a D sharp, that's a D sharp, yeah. Oh no, no, it, it, it's a major seven with a drop nine here. Hang on, hang on. It's like, and they keep messing it up. But that's what's going to happen right now. Except I'm not going to play the track because I, I don't know what the uh, copyright laws are surrounding all of that. So... So like I'm making all the excuses of the day, but there's something like that going on at the beginning. Something like that, yeah. So you can play a little harmonica. It's hard to make those ones sound. On the fifth fret. Something along those lines, yeah. And then it it goes. Basically what's going on during the verse part is an A chord, right? So, and it's arpeggiated, so he's going like this, you know? So that little sus four is put on that third fret on the B string. And it's, a, it, it's not a completely straight method. It's not straight up and down all the time. Sometimes he hits it one way, sometimes it's the other. He's not singing at the same time, so it's a little easier for him to do that. And next up, he hits the, uh, so it's an F sharp minor chord then. This is the relative minor of A, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Then it's a G. So that's like an A slash G chord or something like that. Yeah, it's basically an A chord with a G in the bass. And then it's a D. because you know the main notes is that C and that B. Whatever's going on there, you can go back. If you want to get it perfect, you can pick it up. If you just want to get a fair idea of what it is and learn what you can from the song and move on to something else, then, then just get the basic sound. That's kind of what I do, you know? Some mightn't agree with that method. It works for me, because I've got a sort of jumbled mind, you know what I mean? So I don't really have time for getting everything I absolutely picture perfect. That doesn't work for me, you know? But, uh, so he gets to this bit, right? It's 
except he's doing this, right? Oh, this is crazy. He goes like... So he's fretting there the fifth of the root, right? So it's first fret, high E and B string, yeah? And he does that. So he must have the thumb over, unless he's doing some crazy shit like that. I don't know if Life's and Clefts with the thumb, he might do, because a lot of the moves that he makes would indicate that that would be the most convenient thing to do, really. So he goes like that. Something like that, man. And then it goes into this little zapping riff, it goes. So you've got like three little triad shapes there. First one's the same shape, so it's that one there. Uh, what is what fret are we on there? Seven, eight, seven. Same shape up two frets. And then a little uh, what you would get off the top of the bar chord. So that's ten, ten, nine. So the triads basically are from, that's a G, A, A, B, A, B, A. Um, so I mean basically if you look at it this way, look. There's your G, right? Alright. That's how, if you look at a G bar shape from there, right? And go up to there. If you take, make the same chord from there. So it's like a, in the cage system that would be like a C shape, that there type of thing. Um, and yeah, two frets up, that's A, yeah. And then this. Yeah, so it's good to know those little shapes because say you're playing right on a 1, 4, 5 in, in the key of A, for instance, right? And... Uh, Say the chord progression was something like this, right? Now, I mean, the first thing you're going to do is just go... If you use different little triads and different little shapes, then it gives you different flavors, you know, fruitier type of things to play with. You see guys in reggae and stuff doing this quite often, so you go like this. Shapes are all quite close, so it, you know what I mean. The signs it doesn't sound like there's too much movement going on there. If you were to go like this, that might work for you better. This might work, or something like that. You know what I mean? There's a few different variations you can go to there, you know. Uh, Do you know what I mean? Do you? Do you really? Really? Okay, then we're golden. Right. Still getting used to these light strings, man, so I got myself a lighter pick. Usually I would use the one up from this, uh, Jim Dunlop picks. I would use 88. This is the dark grey ones. These ones are two down, must be 60. So I, somebody gave me this, and I found this really working well for me, so I'm going to buy a pack of them when I can afford it. Um, as well as some of this stuff, which uh, an old bandmate of mine put me on to. Uh, don't hear from him much nowadays. <laughs> I hope he's okay. But uh, it, it's basically like a, a little cloth for cleaning, for maple necks, for cleaning down when you're taking off your strings and stuff. So it's quite good. I, I'm going to be getting that. Uh, when I got this guitar fixed, I got it hardtail. So this is no longer floating, which means it holds this tune much better. The intonation's way better. It's just more consistent. All together, I am playing with nines because I'm used to the heavier strings again because I'd injured my hand. You know, I, I don't like to do too many bends, and when I do, I thought, well, I'd be on the nines now, so that doesn't hurt me so much. But, um, I think I might make the move back up to tens if I can't get used to these just to have that feel a bit more metal beneath my fingers, you know. Uh, like I say, it just works for me. So, I mean, anyway, where were we? We were playing this with. Uh, that G bend there, 
hand there, right? It's a flat seven of A, right? So A par chord. The octave on top, right? So right, left, octave. And the same thing for your D chord. Now obviously that D's a bit more awkward. If you're in the key of A, right, and you're 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 playing a blues and you go one, four, five. You can, you know, that octave is quite easy within reach because it's barred with your with your forefinger. Same when you go up to your four chord, then you're on the A. And when you go up to D, you do that. It's like ah. So you have to employ that your second finger. So you get that sound, but if you want to go. it's on the higher strings it doesn't have the same chunk it doesn't have the same power so I mean usually I would if I was using that D chord I would just have that and maybe bring it down to a seventh if I'm playing blues um, or go up here and hit a flat seven uh, nine chord or something like that those sharp nines are a nice chord if you listen to jazz they place them really well so that whenever you they don't just like Hendrix throw it in the river What they'll do is they'll just place it somewhere nice where it's like, oh, you really feel the effect of that raise nine. It's like, yes, I can appreciate the flavor of that chord. It's like a nice piece of dark chocolate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when I was little, I didn't. I wanted give me give me the milk chocolate, please, with caramel. No, no, I want the dark chocolate. Give me the coffee. See all those coffee ones that are still left in the box of chocolates. I'll eat them. Yeah. So um, <laughs> somebody's got it. So anyway, look. Let's see if we can work this out lyrically where we were. Go ahead. It's quite hard to sing at the same time. Getty Lee. It's not hard for him. He can do anything. He's just like. So what way would he play in that? Right in the verse, pretty well. propel it because obviously what um life's instead is more of a floaty dreamy thing you know so really uh it's up to getty lee to he is the rhythm section you know along with Perth, he's fulfilling the role that the rhythm guitar would usually play as well there he's having to thunk it to really push that part you know and it could, you know he sticks to the one note for the most part he might play a little bit around the, the triads but for the most part there he's just thunking you know and later parts in the song you hear him play some lovely little fills especially at the end and which is beautiful how, how they make that shit happen so let's say it goes like so awkward to play like i don't know what the fingering is for that but i do not have it So this part here, oh, where is it? I think it goes to here. Properly, but let's see if I can do a Tony Bennett Art of Zen and uh, make that high note sound. So we're over there.
you heard the song, which I hope you have, you know that part. <laughs> Wind in my hair, shifting and drifting, mechanical music. I may be totally wrong about that, maybe this part. <laughs> like I say, man, this is Prague. You Prague guys, what is wrong with you? Why can't you just write a normal song like everybody else, yeah? Like, quo, cool. just keep it fucking simple, man, so we can learn your songs. <laughs> um, what do we got here? Yes, it's right. Wind in my hair, shifting and drifting. of the downward second part of the phrase the tone that he puts on it is, is something quite fucking special and it's those little parts that remind me of Johnny Mitchell there's a little bit more of a jazzy thing in it that's quite straight ahead rock rock stuff you know and then so that's in on the F minor chord too, so it might have something to do with that. What's this next bit? I cannot sing the Gary Lee, unfortunately. I spin around with shrieking times. There's like something quaint about that. <laughs> it's lovely. Go, go, not go, 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 screaming through, through the valley. Quite like he's wailing and whooping and riding these notes, you know. He's not just going, bop, 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 bop. <laughs> he's got some fine ass going on here, motherfucker. You know, uh, but look, that's pretty much it. When it comes to the end, it is beautiful fucking shit when, when you get those guys going. <laughs> Lifeson is pretty much just, just hammering that out, you know, he's giving up on the floaty floaty, he's just... He's leaving that space for Pert and uh, fucking Getty Lee to do some oh, really dynamic, beautiful stuff, you know. So he's the man that's going to anchor it now and let those guys do something. Uh, and Getty's doing all sorts of strange things. <laughs> different he's doing like little runs and things isn't he it's quite atmospheric there's a lot of drama in that moment and it is beautiful and then it ends with uh, all of that nonsense uh, I, 
I tried to work out right, Ron. I swear I spent like 10 minutes trying to work out right. It was not working for me. So next up, we are going to look at Red Barquera. Oh my god, the computer just died on me. Yeah, so Red Barquera. Actually, we just looked at Red Barquera, didn't we? And I tell you, my head was like this, Mom. This is why, <laughs> this is why I suck. Believe me, believe me. So Dreadlock Holiday, uh, next up, 10cc. What a tune. If you're not familiar with it, you're about to have your mind exploded by the mastery of uh, these four white guys. Yeah. Uh, why does it matter that they're white? Well, we're about to find out, right? What do I say here? Fucking right. Dreadlock Holiday is a reggae song by 10CC written by Eric Stewart and Graham Goldman. It was the lead single from the band's 1978 Bloody Tourists. Bloody Tourists. The song was based on real events. Eric Stewart and Moody Blues vocalist uh, Justin Hayward experienced in Barbados and Graham Goldman experienced in Jamaica. Uh, so these guys are quite well traveled. Graham Goldman commented some of the experiences that are mentioned are true, and some of them are fairly true. Stuart recalls seeing a white guy trying to be cool and he looks so naff, walking into a group of Afro Caribbeans and being reprimanded, which became the lyric Don't you walk through my words, you got to show some respect. Fucking right, man. Another lyric came from a conversation Goldman had with a Jamaican, who, when asked if he liked cricket, replied, No, I love it. Like, there's not much more to say there. I thought there was going to be a whole spiel. There's not going to be, so we can probably finish up quickly on this number. And uh, you know what's going to happen? I'm, I'm just going to whip it up. We're going to whip it up. Whip it up, baby. Uh, so, uh, yeah, to start with this later. <laughs> changes. He's taking that G minor chord the whole way up here and what he's doing with it is basically like a through feel and muting and a nice loose lead hand. Now, it was kind of hard for me to tell whether it was indeed this. In fact I think it changes. Or this. The relative minors of those same uh, Previous two major chords, so well, it's either G minor, F major, E flat major, yeah. And this is a fucking D minor, and it's a C minor. Apologies for the swearing. I've swore twice in this video, I think that's pretty good. Um, I'm trying to cut down on the swearing, but you know what? It's post watershed, too, isn't it? So we can probably get away with it. Right, so I think it goes something like this. I was walking down the street Concentrating on truck and ride Heard a dark voice beside of me And I looked round in the state of print Saw four faces Because they change up quite a bit, you know, it's like for the verse part, they, they just keep mixing up the chords, I don't know why they do that, but what I do know is that because they are more or less playing like triads, right, and they're playing them quite like high up the neck, the bass, right, is really 
keeping it hammered down, as in, right, these are the chords. And sometimes those guys are kind of skipping or putting, you know, one and a half beats or half a beat on a different chord just for different flavor and stuff like that. And if the bass is still denoting what the chord is, then it doesn't matter so much what's going on up here. Of course it matters, but it sort of flavors what the chord is, you know. It's just like extra stuff going on in the arrangement. You can interpret it that way, really. But, um, you know, this this explanation is, is, is partly uh, to get me out of having to spend like three days trying to work out exactly what it is. I can say, I don't have three days to spend on... What 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 worth the value in that? You know, that's like I say, that's a personal philosophy. If you're like a studio musician or something, you you probably need to know the exact thing. Uh, I'm a I'm a busker. I'm not a slicer. I just play what comes, and sometimes good stuff comes. So look, like, I mean, that's basically what goes in there. Yeah. So it's like. I don't like the key. And another thing I notice is too, it's got that in those chords, so you can't just bluff it and play a bar chord down to there. You've got to get that note in there too with the voices that that they're using, so it forces you to play that. So suddenly the nines and the nice new action that I've got are coming in quite handy. That's a part of it up there. I guess one of the chord sequences. into this little part it goes after the pull right after the course goes into this little part it goes don't you walk through my world you've got to show some respect just that one chord so i mean if we're in the key of g minor that's the relative major <laughs> it's like quite an open part there's lots of space in it you know and of course the, that major chord we haven't really heard that yet uh, so it's um it's right there and it's open and it's so much more meaningful because it hasn't been used in any of the previous progressions. So it's like, plus it's a relative major, so it's sort of like, let's bounce in here, great. And uh, whatever way they play it, I'm not quite sure. I was confused, I thought maybe it was number one four, but I couldn't hear another chord change, so. So what's that? Playing around the chord tones there with some uh, sus action, so it's a uh, fifth, sus, four, sus, four, third, sus, two, root. What's that move there? Note wise, that would be. I remember uh, you know, we spoke with Yako earlier and the thing with that guy was his father was, was also a jazz musician. Not quite the same kind of level as what Jaco got, got to be, you know. Um, but he would go away 
you know, for extended periods, because he's a musician, he would be touring and stuff, and then he, he would get home, and they would spend lots of time together, and, you know, if you've watched the, the documentaries and stuff on, on Jacko, he, he really loved his family, he loved playing with his kids and stuff, and going to the beach, and going to the park, very athletic guy, you know, and, um, the thing is, uh, his dad seen that he was coming on quite a bit with, with the bass. And I think he could play keys and he could probably play anything that guy, guy like that, you know. But um, his dad said, um, yeah, you're coming on good, right? He says, next time I come home, I, I want to be able to point at any fret, right? Any fret in this guitar anywhere and you tell me what note it is. And he fucked off again. <laughs> Way off on terror for another two months, you know. And, um, Yako fucking worked that shit out and his dad came back and he says, look, and his dad said, very good. Respect, kid. <laughs> so they were all cool as far as that went. And, uh, you know, Yako had his, had, his, had, his, had his mental health troubles and stuff and I think probably at a time too when the, I don't really know if, 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 if the treatments were as well researched and, and stuff like that at that time and I think with the life that he led and the drugs and stuff which often comes along with those sorts of things made it especially hard for him uh, but you know you hear stories of he was sleeping out in Central Park and stuff in New York and you know how, how crazy is that you know for people that held him up as a god and suddenly to see him in that in that position you know and um, one of the greatest you know one of the best ever did so it's like Hey man, <laughs> come on Yako, I gotta get you to the hospital man. So look, that's pretty much that song. There's those three bits. It does jump up, but one fret key change, right? Comes up half a step. I don't like cricket. to go too deep with that but basically it's a nice tune it's a sweet tune those guys are playing the reggae well it's not a matter of they're just going oh well we're just gonna go you know they've got that these guys must have been real good musicians 10 cc i kind of wrote them off and speaking of uncles i had an uncle that said that to me one time years ago 10 cc great band and i was like you know what i mean i was like i was like all about the Black Sabbath and Led Zeppelin and, you know, free and stuff like that. So I was like, 10 CC, what are you talking about, you know? Well, they really are, you know, great, great musicians. I wrote some great songs, some great pop songs, you know? <clears throat> and, uh, <coughs> I mean, with that reggae stuff, you know, me being like a, I'm a blues musician primarily. And I try my best, to, I listen to a lot of jazz and I try my best to learn from jazz and then I make the connection then where I see with other forms of music you can say, oh right, these guys are big jazz fans too. They mightn't be all the way, they mightn't be Charles Mingus, you know, but they, they've they taken what they could and they, they brought it in, you know, they mightn't be playing jazz and playing standards and stuff like that, but they've learned how to bring some of that in and, you know, you can hear like in, in reggae and stuff like, say if they were playing that. Things like that, you know. You know, it's one of So, it, it, I mean, what's going on there is just right, one note at a time, obviously. Rather, there are so many effects that you can get with just a plectrum. The way that you pick and how, you, how much you hold the string down. If you... If you feel like that... It's almost like too much. If you want to feed into the mix, right? You know, you like playing guitar, you want to play lead over everything, but you can, eventually you come to a point where you realize, oh, I, I can't just play lead all the time. There's a whole bunch of musicians that are here. I want to try and add to the song. 
right? So how can I fade into the mix and just give a little bit more propulsion to the rhythm? Here? certain choppiness in the picking which are things that you will work out the more you investigate that stuff you will get more of those little techniques you know and you're not going to be impressing people going well look I did a little work on sweet daddy it's like no I played one note motherfucker and not everybody will thank you for it but the guys that really know they will and it will feel good you know it's when you start to get compliments from musicians that are you know, guys guys that you whose, whose respect you would like you know they see you pulling little moves like that you know because it's in a way it, it mightn't be as hard to play in a way it is in a way you know when it comes to your ego and, and your psyche and I, having the thought and the consideration as a musician to go what what can i do here to, to add and not to take away you know and am i going to play here just because i want to play no i'm going to step back out here you know you have to you have to start thinking like that at some point you know so the, like the other thing that's going on there besides the mutant is it took me a while to get this. I seen John Frusciante talk about it when he was talking about funk. He was saying about not, not holding the thing down fully. You can hold it on, you can hold it up, but there's also this thing where you hold it barely. It's like a midway thing where you're just barely fretting it. Very little pressure. So you're getting that percussive thing in the strings. You're sort of doing a sweep action on the strings. You know, there's a little bit of that going on. You hear the reggae guys do that, yeah? boxing videos for this past couple of weeks and that's been my main focus I'm getting on quite well like i say i want to start looking at uh, uh, a bit of an upgrade of equipment and stuff like that you know the boxing videos are fun because you can dive into it and you know assume a certain role and speak right into the camera and get into all the stuff that you know it's great if you're into boxing you know well, obviously not everybody is so um it's good to do some music stuff as well even if i i don't get to uh put on the mask and become the character that I would like to imagine myself to be. Yeah, unfortunately that's not reality. So uh, I gotta do some of this. Um, and I, I wonder, can I play a little song? Uh, Up, but you know I don't care and you know what this video is gonna go up on Facebook because Facebook does a wonderful thing where it ups the volume by about a hundred percent so that I can actually be heard and uh, I think anyway with the music vids they're, they're sort of um, it's mostly people on Facebook that want to see them anyway I'll put it on the YouTube as well I'm sure you guys don't really care that much about all that stuff but <laughs> Just thinking out loud, baby. Right?
much I miss my lady Emma Rena's in the corn field Riding in the day frame Lepping like a lost day fly Running through the grass actually good about this whenever I sing a song and make an absolute all aches of it is uh, it forces me uh, to have to go away and learn it it shames me into actually having to learn it because um, I did learn Rocky and I played it the other night on work Madden's and do you know what it went down a storm so <laughs> Some of you people might be watching these thinking, this guy sucks. <laughs> this guy ain't good. I am, I mean it. You just haven't seen it. You just have to wait. You just have to wait. So, look, um, you know, there's not much more to be said other than what already has been. I'm gone. So, um, yeah, look, I mean, what can I say, man? Boxing's boxing. I still got a love for the box I'm on, but I had to, I had to come, and, come and do this bit of music stuff. And, you know, hopefully get somebody gets some of the benefit out of it. I don't know if I'll upload it directly to Facebook because, do you know, I kind of don't like the idea of that. You get the views, you see it's like, oh, I got 200 views. One of them has like 400 views, the first one I've ever done. And, you know, whilst that's nice and all, you don't know how many people are just looking at it and going, oh, what the fuck. And watch it for three or four seconds. Oh, nah, nah. Whereas if I have it over on my YouTube, it's like, look, it's there. I put a wee link up on my Facebook. If you want it, it's over there, okay? And then when I see those views on YouTube, I can go to myself, yeah. Yeah, baby. I know what's going down, and it's all good. It's all good. Anyway, guys, Belfast Blues unboxing. Uh, with the emphasis on the blues tonight, yeah, for once. So, have a nice evening all you folks, and we'll see you again tomorrow. Be good. <laughs>